Hello everyone, my name is Richard Michael Owen here at Owen Automotive and I'm restoring this 1957 Jaguar XK150 fixed head. Let's do it. Okay, back on the XK150 here at Owen Automotive. Let's have a look under the hood. Okay, there it is, the classic Jaguar 3.4, 3.5 liter engine, twin overhead cam, just beautiful, a thing of beauty. It looks really clean from the top. It doesn't look like a lot of cleanup to be done up here, but there's a lot to look at. First thing we, see, we can see is the chassis number here. There it is right there. And you can see the engine number there. It says Dash 8 for 8.0 compression. Uh, the air conditioning is uh, right, the compressor is right here on the top. Maybe once we redo it, kind of paint it black, kind of hide it. And part of that package is the big aluminum radiator there and the big cooling fan out front. So I think we're going to retain these pieces, probably just paint the tank of the radiator, hide it, make it black and make it match the car, not stand out so much. Inside the V here is the blue paint. I think it's supposed to be blue metallic. So that'll be nice to get refinished properly. And the porcelain exhaust manifolds are looking pretty good down there. Don't need to order two of those and all the brass nuts are on there. Isn't that nice? You can see the accelerator linkage popping up here. It goes up and over. Pretty typical for the left-hand drive Jaguars. All right, we're going to have a look at the intake. Classic British setup. Twin SUs. Lovely HS6 is sitting in there. They have a starting carburetor here. It's electronically controlled choke. And that is turned on with the flick of a switch or sometimes an otter switch turns that off and on. Now these cars could have come with triple SU carburetors for the S model setup. It's very, very tight in here. It throws the air cleaner right into the inner fender, but it does look all the business, even if it's a real pain to work on. Um, more stuff, all trying to take the same space here. We got the wiper motor, voltage regulator, all the fuse blocks are into this cover here. And if anybody has the original nut here, I'd love to find one. Starter solenoid and some air conditioning lines here that we're going to have to deal with. So yeah, lots going on under here, but overall looking really good. Here's an otter switch. This will, this will break a uh, ground signal at a certain temperature. Could have used this to control the electric fan, but it, that's not going on here. So something else is going on. Maybe it runs consistently. Here's the sender for the temp gauge. Now, the next thing I got to do is take off this aluminum hood. It's, it's an absolute beauty, never been hit. So I'm going to take that off and very, very carefully strip it down to its bare aluminum. Maybe do some soda blasting or some chemical strip because really don't want to ruin all those beautiful shapes of the hood. And then get, in, get into the chrome at the front here and start removing some of these chrome pieces. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff to do here. Still got to really think about disconnecting all the stuff on the firewall to lift the body up and around this engine. It's going to be a big job. All right, nearly got the grill out, but really got to double check the fit. So I'm looking for that outer chromed area and how it seats. And one thing I don't like is when you look this way, that big gap right there and the gap up here too. So what I'm gonna do is get this apart, see what comes off the car first, and then see if we can make adjustments to get it to sit just a little better down here. So yeah, gonna make sure it's right before it gets sent to chrome. So when I first took off this grill piece, I noticed this chrome finisher was awfully close to this hole here that supports this piece. And this overlap was really gross. And what I noticed is looking at pictures of an original car is that this trim piece actually, get this in, it should just butt up against it like that. So that's gonna let it sit a lot flatter. So get that going, get this piece of chrome in the right place, and then we can start working on the grill a little more. Okay, I'm having real fun with this grill here. It needs a bit of adjustment this way and that way, but I think it'll make a lot of difference in the end. One thing I've been doing is grinding it down to kind of more match the profile here. You can see those black lines there. That's why I've been grinding. I'm gonna do it a little bit more. And all this is underneath that finisher piece which goes on, so I'm not too worried about it, but it is getting close right here. You see my line of scrimmage and where I'm grinding. 
I think I can get away with a little bit more and try to really get this gap a little bit better. And also a couple things I noticed. So look at this, see the paint here is chipped and that's because this is a tight spot right here. So I'm gonna take some off of that tight spot and really work on this grill and try to get it as best it's, as it can be seated before I start working on the finisher piece that goes over top of it. Okay, I've been having a lot of fun kind of filing away the brass and really helping this grill overcome this radius here which it doesn't have any provision to do whatsoever originally. And so I filed it down. I'm pretty happy with that. When it's tightened down, the gap is pretty minimal. The next thing to do is really deal with this badge, what I'll call the badge holder, because when it attaches to the grill, it's, it makes the grill proud here on the driver's side quite severely. And you can see on the body right here and here where it's been sitting for years. So I'm going to take this thing and file at it. You can see here that the factory actually, I can see the filing marks from the factory was dealing with this area. So I'll just continue their good work and get this grill fitting a little better. One thing I'll note is on the, all the XKs that I run across, I'm going to see how well this area all coalesces and uh, see how the other restores handle it because I'm sure I'll, I'll, it's pretty easy to overlook stuff like this. Okay guys, I've had this grill off probably 50 times. Just really trying to be careful that I make all the right moves. And I'm pretty happy with this fit. I think that's about as good as it gets because this grill was never really designed for this relief here. But yeah, I'm happy with this. I think I can set it to chrome now. Yeah, I feel like kind of a bit of a craftsman here just filing away on some brass. It's kind of a fun job really. But what you take away, you can never put back on. So it's a very careful, careful job. But you can look over here. I'm pretty happy with that. To really get in, to make that gap any smaller, you'd really be reinventing the wheel, I think. But now I think it's going to look good. And yeah, I'm happy with this. So it's ready for the chromer. Now, one thing I got to note is that there is some damage to the to this teeth here, right here and here. So... I'm going to see what my electroplater thinks about that, if that's repairable. So that's one thing. And on the other side, I'll show you a different shot here. All the 1032 studs, they're all worn away and looking nasty. So I'm kind of contemplating whether or not we should definitely braze in some new studs there or not. Because the way it is here, you can kind of wham on some speed nuts. But yeah, I'm gonna, that's definitely two considerations for repairing this grill. And I'll say that, you know, all this seems lot, pretty long-winded and a lot of work, but it's this kind of stuff that puts you in the right place for when you have perfect chrome and perfect paint and everything just kind of matches and goes together and it makes you, makes you a good, makes for a good day. Because when you start thinking about these things after the fact, that's when you get into trouble. And that's really where, I think that makes it, that's one of the main differences between an amateur and a professional restoration or it comes from just experience, knowing what to look for and having that eye really to make things right. The grill's just sitting here. It isn't fastened down, but a little bit of before and after here shows you what a difference I made on that gap on the driver's side. Okay, the grill's out for the last time. Now it's time to really look at the hood and its fit. I already know it doesn't really line up very well down here and that's normal. I'm not going to look at the gaps and so on the driver's side here it looks really really pleasant and then it kind of opens up at the back here i don't think that's right i think that's a little excessive but it's even worse when we go to the passenger side then oh no here it comes yeah look at this gap i can stick my finger in there that's really no good and then the whole way down the side here it's just way proud so I'm going to try to sink this down and see what it looks like and adjust it at the hinges. Show you what they look like. There they are in there. So I have provision to go up and down and left and right, but not backwards and forwards. And from what it looks like, it might want to go a little backwards, but we'll go down on this side and see what it looks like. Trying to drop this hinge down. I have to get to one of the bolts here, but... Pretty close to the starter solenoid. That's the hot side, so let's disconnect the battery. Oh, 
Okay, what do we got? Pretty greasy looking spline, kind of dirty. Some sort of aftermarket wheel cylinder, but what we're after is the battery in here, usual raw area on these cars. So let's see what we find. Okay, out comes the battery. Kind of a weird spot for the battery behind the wheel. I'm not a huge fan of it. It gets sealed in here and the acidity of the battery generally corrodes out this area. And I've seen a previous repair here. I just noticed there's an access panel right here. There's a couple screws on it. Let's take that off and see where we get. Okay, last screw. Let's see what we find behind here. I think it's too high for the oil filter, isn't it? So what am I gonna get here? Underneath the intake manifold. What am I going to get? Oil filter? It's jammed in. Oh, it has to slide that way? I mean, it's not going to come up very easy. Give it that. Come on now. Okay, cotter pins out of the way. Ah, the air filter, of course. <laughs> That was a kind of a surprise. I should have known better though. Okay, let's just dive into this battery box area because there's some things that are pretty interesting. One of them is the paint. So this is kind of where the car goes from being black to white with no real definitive uh, line at all. Looks like maybe the car was just painted white and the undercoater sprayed on underneath, but yeah, it's hard to know really. There's some provisions or a right-hand drive car, and this car isn't right-hand drive. That's pretty interesting. Big, thick chassis you can see in there. And the battery hold down mechanism with these ready rods is damn ugly. So hopefully there's some sort of hook system that we can buy. And I guess this battery tray will be okay, but we'll see once it gets blasted and how clean it looks. I was kind of surprised to see that air filter there. Holy, take off the wheel to get at your battery and your air filter. What a design, holy. Yeah, just putting the wheel back on. I noticed that there's a lot of play in the steering rack. Quite a lot, actually. So you have to check the mounts and the rack itself. Well, there we go. Made some progress on the hood. Dropped the hinge down, made this gap way better. That's awesome. Made it pretty tight here. And it's pretty gappy as it goes down here towards the front. So I think this is where I'm gonna leave it for the body guys, let them deal with it, but I have to find a way to get this edge here to sink down further into here. Right now it's touching, so I guess the next step, if it was me, I'd probably start hitting this surface, but I'm gonna leave it to the body guys and see what they are gonna do. So for now, I'm pretty happy with the way it fits. Overall, I think this is gonna be really workable and usable. Gap's a little big over here, but, uh, yeah, we'll take it off and get it stripped. Took the hood off, got quite the view up here. Looks pretty cool from right overhead. Yeah, I don't know how to get this dash pad off. And with all these ex extra systems in here, there's not a lot of room to go and look and see what's fastening in it. So instead, I'm gonna take them out. First, I'm gonna take out the power steering unit. This is a great unit. It seems to work lovely in the car, especially when you're trying to park. Essentially what it does is it replaces the whole upper steering column. And there's a huge motor in here that helps turn the wheels, electric power assist. So I gotta deal with all this wiring. I got, a, I think a pentometer up in here and a relay block and CPU up in there. So I'll draw that all downward and we'll see what we're up against. Steering wheel has to come off too, and I'm replacing this wheel because it's loose in the hub, and that's pretty terminal on these old wheels. So we got a new one already in. Okay, the steering wheel here is stuck on the shaft, pretty typical. So all I gotta do is put the nut back on the spline here, hit with a lead hammer, and hopefully break it loose. I think that was it. There it is. Easy does it.
Okay, we've got the standard XK column here. You can see here it's adjustable, and this collet here locks down on the column and lets you have a lot of adjustment. But I don't know how it's held into the unit here. There's no grub screws or anything here, so I'm gonna have to go further into the dashboard. I'll take off this chrome finisher and this piece and see if it reveals anything. Okay, got the two little grub screws out. One of them had a bit of Loctite on them. That doesn't look Loctite, more like Teflon sealant, but made it hard to get out. And that lets me withdraw this piece completely. See, it's kind of like a splined shaft. I still don't know how the original unit is in there. Hmm, it's further investigation. Okay, I gotta figure it out. It wasn't these lower grub screws. There was one hiding underneath that sleeve that'll let me uh, get off the original spline. And I think I wanna do that because there's some teeth in there. Can you see that? They're kind of flattened over and it really restricts how far the collet and the wheel can go in and out. So it'll be nice to address that. So yeah, just gonna take out this grub and then we'll be able to withdraw the original unit. Got a bit of a rat's nest here under the dash, but this easy power system's actually pretty simple. Got the main power here coming off the starter solenoid with 40 amp fuse. Loving that, that's nice and safe. Got a white line here coming down to a relay holder, but there's no relay in it. So I think this is deletable. I can just run the ignition wire straight to power the CPU. There's a pentometer here. This was attached underneath. I think this senses when maybe the car's in an accident. I'm not sure, but it knows if there's if the car's accelerating or decelerating. So that's important. Uh, there's another line up and in here. It's a big black line that runs up to the speedometer and, and attaches to the drive. That tells the computer how fast the car is going. And then a ground wire, and that's it. So it looks like a lot going on, and it will take a while to tidy it up, but I think it's going to go in pretty clean and be a pretty simple install when it goes back in. So yeah, really happy with that. Basically now everything from, the, from here to the firewall is going to be coming out, and that's part of the whole system. So yeah, awesome. All right, I think I got everything unhooked from this power steering unit. Let's see if it'll slide out. Oh, it's coming. Okay, I'm running out of space here. Careful, watch the splines. Ah, there it is. Got it out. All right, I got this easy power steering system on the bench. It's a pretty nice looking unit. I have to say I'm pretty impressed with the way the fit and finish of it all and the way the splines all attach. And you can see the original upper column here from Jaguar and it slides right in there and it's, it's quite nice the way it goes in. So that's really impressive. I like the way they integrated that. And if you look at the original setup here in the factory workshop manual, you can see the upper spline here that it replaces completely and it's housing. So I think in that regard, this is a pretty elegant solution. Yeah, there is one compromise to this power steering system, and that's this big cutout area that need to be cut out for that big motor to sit in right here. And right now we have the luxury of seeing exactly how much space it needs. And when we have the dashboard out and we have this thing down to bare metal, we can really clean this up and make it look professional and make it look like a factory install. Steering's all out. Next job is the AC system built into this car. This is a classic auto air unit. We're looking at the evaporator here. And basically it takes in fresh air from the, well not fresh air, but cabin air from behind, cools it and brings it outward towards these vents. It's pretty simple removal here, but I really have to pay special attention to the wiring because a lot of the hot leads are black and the ground wires are black. So I really got to make note of how that goes together. And there's just, auxiliary switch here yeah, I think it's pretty nice so we'll just keep that this controls the temperature and the fan I believe so I'm gonna have to I'll drop everything down and we'll have a closer look but I think it's gonna be a uh, pretty simple to take it out just have to make note of all this wiring mess yeah this is not good um, and so when it goes back in really gonna have to tidy it up 
Okay, I'm not an XK guy, but I just figured out something finally, and that's how to get this dashboard off. There were two of these slotted machine screws kind of in here at an angle. And when I took them out, I found the whole fascia panel's loose. So all I need to do is take these thumb screws out and remove two knobs, and we're going to get a lot more access. This is fantastic. Okay, I'm quite excited to see what this looks like. It's finally coming out. Wow, look at that. Another plate back there. Wow. Oh, look at the way it's all fastened in there. Okay, this is really interesting. Okay, let's have a closer look here. It looks like everything's mounted on this metal plate. It probably provides a ground for the gauges. It looks like a really nice, secure way to do this. You can see the bulb holders are built in. Probably try to get some, uh, some LED units, make the dash brighten up a lot. And you can see the back side here of the dashboard or the dashboard fascia. It's wooden, it's beautifully made. And I think this piece here along the bottom is custom to accommodate the air conditioning controls. So yeah, look at all the access we have now to deal with them. It's fantastic. And I see this one temperature line running from the AC unit to this control unit here. So I'm gonna have to really respect that and not bend it too much more. With this fascia panel off, now I can see the construction of the overall dashboard. And it's kind of counterintuitive to how normal dashboards come apart. So what I need to do is take off these side pieces and then I can take the dash pad off. If you look up in there, there's some hardware there that I can deal with after the side panels are off. And this is totally the opposite of all the later Jaguars where you can just take the dash pad off without having to disassemble the entire dashboard. But yep. Take these off, and then we'll probably be left with a whole bunch of metal and ducting. Okay, here's all the dashboard pieces on the bench, and now we can have a really good look and figure out what we got. Basically, the side pieces in the center dash are wood covered in vinyl, and the center is covered in leather here. And I think I want to redo this. I don't know if it comes up on camera, but it's a little lumpy around where the gauges are, and. It, I don't really like the grain of the leather, so I think we're gonna redo that. Also the chrome, can you see it here? If it focus, it's just kind of pitted and gross. So I'm gonna spend the extra time and effort and really make this area look fantastic. It's right in front of the driver, so why not have this look like the best it can be? Now, this car has a Tremec 5-speed in it. There's no overdrive, so I'm probably gonna delete the overdrive switch I mean, it'll stay with the car, but it won't be installed. And that's because I really hate having switch gear on a car that do nothing. Yeah, so gonna get all these little strips re-chromed and then redo the, all the leather and the vinyl here. It just isn't totally quite nice. Like it's not, it's, it's, it's okay, it's fine, it's passable, but it's not a really high-end job. And what we're gonna do is make this really high-end. The glove box is actually aligned quite well. You can see there's a nice little trim that goes all the way around. There's this odd green flocking in there. And so, yeah, it'll be nice to do a, redo all this. It'll be a bit of work, but I think it'll be worth it. It'll be really beautiful and spectacular for the owner in the end, and that's what we're going for. Just got the trunk off of the car, and I want to revisit it because I noticed some things when it was upside down that I didn't really see when we were looking at it in the last episode. So, yeah, this thing is an ash-framed trunk with a steel skin on the outside. And the result of that isn't very good. So right here I noticed with it upside down that we're missing a little corner support piece. And in there I'm noticing some corrosion. So my theory is that they just assembled this, painted it all together as an assembly and put it on the car. And that would be great if this skin wasn't in steel. I'll see, show you what I mean because I took off one of the this steel bracket that supports the hinge. And underneath, what do we find? We find bare metal and rust. And so I'm not a huge fan of this construction at all. It's akin to more of a pre-war design. And in that case, they probably would have skinned this thing in aluminum and not steel. And right now we have a whole bunch of aluminum and steel and wood sandwich. That's just impossible to completely remove all the rust. But luckily for us, a lot of this is just kind of superficial. It hasn't gone serious. So I think we're going to be able just to save this trunk as is and we'll take out as much rust as we can. Also, another thing on the leading edge here, 
You can see it just creeping in here too. So we'll take out as much as we can and preserve it as best we can. But this trunk is really solid. It's really good. It's not flimsy at all. So I don't want to take it apart. Here's a look at that evaporator. I got it outside of the car now. You can really look at the lines here, the intake and output, and they're insulated, I guess, to stop con condensation. The blower motor here in the back is made in China. And really, this is just blowing the air through the radiator system and into the car. Okay, now that I've dealt with the evaporator underneath the dashboard there, I can give you guys a tour of the AC system under the hood. And from the evaporator, the refrigerant, I think it turns into a gas at this point, comes into this hard line. Across the firewall, I think I want to get some old school loop clamps and really fasten that in place. It looks kind of wayward just sitting there. Snakes around here and it ends up at the compressor, which really just moves the refrigerant through the system. You can see the hard line, it kind of kinks downward there and pokes through right here. And it actually sends it to the top of the condenser here, which condenses the refrigerant into a liquid, I believe again. And it picks up at the bottom once it's been cooled down, it goes up and over to the dryer here. I think that just dries it out on the system. And it kind of kicks it up and over the intake there. I think I want to lower that. It's kind of ugly, but it works. And eventually we'll make our way back down to the hard lines here to the evaporator. And on the starter solenoid, here there's a fuse and a relay control to control the fan. I might, I'll probably keep that, or maybe I might try to tie into this fuse system. I don't know, we'll see. But yeah, that's a whole tour. All this stuff's coming out. Just got those refrigerant lines out of the engine bay. They were all pretty simple, except for one. This one right here, this hard line, it will not come out past the radiator and over this support bracket. And I, my dad figures that it must have been fabricated in the car, and I think he's right, because you look at this kind of a connector that's adjustable, and I think it's soldered together in situ, and that lets um, the if the AC guys fabricate things like this in situ and it's definitely a specialist trade and uh, when we get this system re-pumped with refrigerant it'll definitely be an AC tech that'll do that. So that does it for this episode but there's a lot more work. Gotta really get all these components out and clear out the engine bay, the cooling system and really work towards getting the body off the frame. Well, that does it for this episode of the Jaguar XK150. Thanks for watching, everybody. And as always, if you have any tips, tricks, comments, trade secrets, I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below. And we have a long way to go with this one. The engine bay still looking pretty complete, so there's a lot of episodes to go. Yeah, so hopefully you guys are willing to come along with the ride and we can experience this together. Okay, well, that does it for this episode. See you, everybody. Bye-bye.